Pour overs, the second main category of slow bar. If you're not sure what I mean by slow bar, you can check out my last video here. Really, these are all different designs of the same technique, but it's different enough from the rest of the methods that I believe it deserves its own video. Pour overs have probably become the most popular option in coffee shops these days next to the espresso bar. Simply put, it's the handmade version of what your household drip machine would make. Even if you're not great at finding tasting notes, this method pulls out distinguishable flavors from different beans and roasts. Rather than letting the beans steep, you pour water over the grinds and let the liquid coffee fall out the bottom as quickly as gravity can pull it. What pretty much all these designs have in common is that they're either a ceramic, metal, or plastic basket with some sort of taper to hold a paper, metal, or fabric filter. There's a wide range on how clear or cloudy your coffee will be based on the choice of filter, but it's a relatively quick and low maintenance way to make coffee that really brings out all the personality of the bean of choice. There are two major differences that have made this method a favorite. The first being that since the water is pulled through the grind so quickly, it requires a finer grind to get the same brew. And this is a good thing, something the immersion filter techniques don't really lend themselves to. The finer grind allows the flavors to be extracted from the coffee bean very evenly. The second is the bloom. The bloom is achieved by pouring warm water over the grinds initially, just enough that no coffee starts dripping out the bottom. You'll see the grinds start to foam and bubble. This is because CO2 is now rapidly being released from the grinds. As this is happening, the grinds expand, priming them for extraction. You generally only allow this to happen for a few seconds, but if you leave it for a little bit longer, it can help bring out more personality from an older coffee. With little practice and experimenting, not only does this prime the beans, it can help redeem them. This process is not impossible with immersion filter techniques. In fact, to some degree, you should try doing it, but it's less meaningful with the coarse grinds and harder to get right. As I mentioned in part one, immersing coffee is the oldest way that we have of making drinkable coffee. It's simple and it makes sense, and from the time we started drinking coffee until relatively recently, it was the only idea we had. The history is admittedly a little bit fuzzy from here, but from what I can tell, our earliest designs for pour over coffee were invented by Jean-Baptiste de Belloy, the Archbishop of Paris. It was perhaps the first percolated coffee, not to be confused with the brutish and awful machines that you still find at churches and community centers today. This term was simply used to describe the fact that the coffee was pulled through the grinds and the filter by gravity rather than being left to rest in the water. Dry coffee was put over a filter and water was poured over it and allowed to drip immediately into a chamber below where it was served from. The coffee that was produced was largely awful by today's standards, but it was a step in the right direction. One of the major problems was the cloths that were being used. Not only was the way that the fabric was being processed giving a lot of flavor to the coffee, but these cloths were often used for other things. There's even stories of people using old socks to brew coffee, which couldn't have gone over very well. And before this method, your grind size didn't really matter, but now if your grinds were too coarse, you could produce a sour and weak coffee very, very easily. It took some time to work out the kinks. In 1809, an eccentric engineer from America was spending some time in Paris and helped develop it further. I'm a little unclear on exactly how he developed it, but it became known as the French drip coffee pot, a method still found commonly in New Orleans today. From here passes about a century of stagnancy. Nothing really develops in the world of coffee. Americans and Europeans continue largely scalding their beans over their kitchen burners. And filters are not in common use. They're not unheard of, but most Americans are drinking their coffee cloudy or using unconventional methods to clear their cups. Over this time, mesh metal filters were introduced and paper filters start coming over from Japan. These options all still exist, and though they make a difference in the end cup, they don't make or break the cup of coffee. Metal filters are the most permeable material we use, and because of this, they create the cloudiest cup of coffee, and with that comes a delightful, rich and full body, noticeably more so than the other filters. This comes from the few smaller suspended grounds and all of the coffee oils that have made their way into your cup. Kept clean, these filters should impart no unwanted flavors into your coffee. It's unlikely that you'll find any grinds in your cup. However, they do maintain some of the body by allowing most of the oils into your cup. These filters are the most likely to add outside flavors to your coffee, and because of this, they must be cared for meticulously. For this reason, they are the least popular choice in North America. Paper filters are the finest of the three, allowing no grinds or oils into the coffee, creating the crispest cup. And so long as they're rinsed out beforehand, they will add no outside flavor to the coffee. This mixed with their disposability have made them by far the most popular choice in North America. The Melita style drippers are the oldest design still in common use. A German housewife, Melita Benz, took the developing pour over method and made two decisions. The first was to create a dripper that brewed directly over the cup it was to be served in. The second was to file a US patent for a paper filter to fit into that dripper. Both of these proved to be excellent ideas. The original design was a flat bottom cylinder, but have since developed into V-shaped cones with two flat sides. Though the intended purpose was to use paper filters, I've seen them used with fabric and metal filters as well. These drippers have smaller holes, arguably allowing for more control, but also creating a longer brew time. Next came the Chemex in 1941. It runs coffee through a thicker paper filter placed in an hourglass-shaped glass pot. 
The thicker paper allows you to use a coarser grind because it takes longer for the water to leak through it. And the size of the Chemex is made to easily accommodate multiple servings, as opposed to these other methods which generally cap out around two. The standard more and more is becoming the V60 cone, a design made popular by Hario in recent years. Similar to the Melita, but with no flat sides, the cone tapers to a hole at 60 degrees all the way around. Perhaps chosen because the angle creates a more consistent extraction or because it creates a quicker brew, which is better for commercial environments. Either way, it's becoming the norm more and more. The Kalita refers to a variety of flat bottom drippers, though technically it should only refer to the brand that made them popular. It took the original Melita design in a different direction, staying away from the drastic v -ing. The argument for them is that since they create a puck with the grinds, it creates the most even extraction, similar to an espresso machine, rather than these other designs where the grinds at the top are spent less than the grinds at the bottom. Though I've only seen these used with paper filters, they do offer a wide variety of hole size and formations at the bottom, arguably adding to a more even extraction, but also allowing for the risk that the water get passed through the grinds too quickly, creating a weak cup of coffee, just like the Debeloy pot that started it all. At the end of the day, the differences between these designs are very small. They're all different roads to a very similar result, and they are the least biased way to extract a cup of coffee, allowing the bean to shine for all of its own personality and flavor rather than the method. The discussion over which design is best is worth having, but ultimately rather nominal. Hopefully this gives you a fuller look at why the pour over has become such a favored method among coffee shops, and also why it can look so different depending on where you order it from. And as always, I encourage you to go out and find which design you like best. Between these two videos, you may have noticed that I missed a few methods, namely the Nell Drip, the Turkish Pot, and the Mocha Pot. But these are niche methods for a later video, so stick around for that and more coffee content coming from this channel. And as always, your likes, comments, shares, and subscriptions are always appreciated. Thanks again for watching. Dry coffee was added on top of the filter and then water was pulled over. Oh, pulled over. Woo woo! Dry <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> <laughs>